Okay, I'm on and I'm with Shane. Um, just to recap, although you and I know this, you were on episode 50, 58? 58. 58. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, 58. Sorry, I actually have it up <laughs> over there on the left. I was trying to, I don't know why I was trying to remember off the top of my head. That was goofy. Um, yeah, so, uh, and you wrote an, an insanely good piece um, that actually made me angry when I read it uh, because it's so good. And this one is a, is of the same vein. It also made me, I was like, damn it. Um, <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> so, yeah. So talk to me. This is, we're going to look at the finale of a novella you're writing or a finale of a, like, what is, what are we looking at? Uh, so it's a short story. Okay. Well, I guess nice. novelette. I don't know. It's about 9,000 words. So Awesome. Yeah. I don't think it doesn't matter what you call it. Who knows? I feel like yeah. it's always like, I just, we just throw these terms around and, they're just like not a novel like <laughs> um all right so we're i'm just gonna share the screen um dude i loved it your <laughs> your body language is crushing it you're so yeah i'm just gonna scan it real quick with the eye this is what i love about your writing is that visually you can just see that like, oh, this thing is dialogue driven and it's moving really fast and it's varied, right? Like, and what I, what I love, like, so up here, we've got some paragraph, like not heavy, but some, some bigger paragraphs as we're building into it, but then just scanning it, I can totally tell that you're going to start building here to a big climax because you can see how things are speeding up with just like the shortness of the of the sentences and i i love this kind of piece where i can see like oh and we're going to slow down here a little bit and then i can just by scanning it i'm like oh and then we're back to the races again like so i just scanned through it with my eye the first time i was like dang this is a this is a really well constructed piece in that there's going to be some varied emotional tone there's going to be some movement in it which is really nice um and you're you're you crush it with body language your body language is is off the charts so um oh, thanks man yeah let me just show an example again this is one of those pieces where i was like i pulled it up and i was like oh, what, do, what do i have to say about this um i mean i can always have something <laughs> to say but it's really strong so like right here opening um words of a character my hand uh i'm shuffling ready to deal when a knock on when a knock comes at the door my hand's still on the cards you're expecting someone right like that like body language right there speaks so much as to what's there's a lot of tension in it there's a lot of like you know anxious energy just in that one sentence um you know or here like i shoot to my feet how did he find us my heartbeat is erratic. We need to leave. Helena worries at her lip with her teeth uh, jigging on the spot. Helena, she snaps out of it, right? Like, so this is uh, your body driving this piece with like the way you're using body language combined with dialogue is really fantastic. You're really carrying the emotional tone in a really nice, nice way. So great job. Man. Thank you. Yeah, I was really impressed. Um, what are you doing when you write that? Are you imagining, is that just coming out of you? Are you imagining that? Is this like a multi-draft thing? Like, how are you getting to this level of like dialogue and body language? Yeah, so this this piece actually came to me quite quickly, uh, the actual finale. The I'm quite a visual person, so I see the scene in my head. Nice. Rather than, so I'd imagine it like a movie, so I can hear the dialogue and see the scene playing out in my head. Okay. One of the things I'm going to I'm going to push you about a little bit is I can tell that you're watching it in your head and it's mm. super it's super um, cinematic, which is awesome, especially for our, our day and age. Um, it's going to struggle with an audio tag. Talk to me about dialogue tags and what your because this is a little bit of a style thing. So I'm just curious, like, what's your. Um, what you're feeling about dialogue tags that he said, she said, I can tell you're avoiding them a little bit, but what's your yeah. goal? I don't know if that's overly intentional. I think it's hard because I don't want to put them in and lose any of that, the body language that makes it feel 
like you're connected to the characters and i don't want to use body language and a dialogue tag because it's pointless yeah um, sometimes it's not and i'm going to push back on you a little bit that sometimes okay. you need them um so we'll get into that that was just one of, before we started really diving into the piece something i wanted because there are moments where i feel like oh you need to add attribution here um but it won't i don't think it'll take away from the body language because the body language is doing more than attribution it's the body language is also carrying that um communicating how the not just who says it but how it should be under how it should be heard right like you know going back to that first line i read i'm shuffling ready to deal when a knock comes at the door you expecting someone without that like my hands still on the cards mm. Without that, that you expecting someone could be read in like seven different ways. Yeah. So what the what the body language here is doing is not just communicating who's speaking, but also communicating how we should hear this line as it appears in like the imagination of our ears, right? Like, or, uh, you know, who is it, right? Like I can read who is it like 10 different ways. So like, who is it I said like that is going to sound totally different than the nape of my neck prickles who is it right like yeah <laughs> so it's not just about indicating who's speaking what you're doing that's really fantastic is you're giving us an audio picture of like how these things should sound to us what the like tone of voice is that the person has without saying like who is it i said with fear and worry right like so it's that kind of yeah so that being said in some places, adding dialogue tags to, especially when the dialogue really starts moving, adding those tags to like um, enhance the reader's understanding so they don't have to think too much about what's going on, I think is gonna, mm -hmm. is gonna benefit you. Um, yeah, so let's go through it. Really fantastic bio language. So you, when you sent this to me, you told me it was the finale. Is this the last chapter of the novella or is there more after this? Uh, no, there's one more that is just, kind of a mini resolution that okay because so, it's going to be kind of book 0 0.5 in the series so there's a tiny hook into book one at the end okay you open up with this summary that's really well written <clears throat> but i'm always going to challenge a good summary uh <laughs> helen and i sat cross-legged in the living room playing poker we found a buyer for the egg turns out that creepy jonesy has connections god knows how given the state of him and he and he's hooked us up had to promise 10 percent of the takings but it's worth it we're scheduled to meet the buyer in two hours so that you're summarizing a conversation that happened before and i'd let it go except that you came down here and then started telling us how they felt about that conversation mm -hmm. helen's helen is worried about jonesy's double crossing us but that won't be a problem if the grease ball rats us out i know enough about his witch bane dealing to land him in a pile of steaming shit so he'll uh be up to his neck in it so here you're telling us like giving us insight into how both of these characters are going to interact in the world because you took it there i would say we need to see this scene yeah yeah it's a, and it's a solid scene right like you've got a great it sounds like you've got a great hazard character there like a character with a big potentially big voice that could bring a lot of like you know fun and um fun and games i guess for lack of another word um to jump in there in this jonesy right like an, a really strong like oh this would be an entertaining conversation to have um is there a reason you summarized it did you just not want to write it yeah i don't i think that's probably it he okay. does appear earlier in the story obviously the the creepy character yeah yeah um, yeah now you've pointed it out i can't, i see where you're coming from yeah so we need to hear it and there's two things in the piece that i'm going to jump around a little bit i hope that's okay yeah, there's cool. there's two things in the piece that i would encourage you to put in this conversation mm -hmm. one is around page five yeah um we talk about liquid silver so you introduce this is this introduced somewhere else in the story that liquid silver is like a healing agent for witches mm. No, it, I, I struggled with this one because it's going to be a reader magnet. Mm -hmm. um, by the, you know, I'll, 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 I'll advertise it in the end of book one and all that stuff. 
So by the time they get to the end of book one, they'll already know what yeah. the so property is. We want our we want our like so let's let's say this is a reader magnet potentially you're going to be like putting it up on book funnel and all these places for people to go grab before for free before they potentially engage your novel um so we want this to stand alone even though you know like okay this is an introduction to the world we want it to stand alone as a really strong piece on its own which means in the finale we cannot be introducing new devices because and by devices I mean like things that radically impact the plot, because you want the finale to be the coming together of all of the pieces that you've introduced. Like, oh, that gun, Chekhov's gun that you saw in scene one. <laughs> now I'm going to shoot somebody, <laughs> right? Like that kind of like. Um, and so here you do it twice. Here, first is you snatch the silver, and you and you always as a writer we always know we're doing this in a finale when we have to take lines to explain what it is right like so she snatches the silver syringe off of me liquid silver what it should heal my spine i don't it's just silver works on witches right like so so bad right well, it's not bad but it's just like right here i'm like okay if this were chapter one i'd be like oh cool okay so i know silver works on witches but because it's the finale it's like okay th- we got to get this in before this moment right like we have to and we don't need to see anybody necessarily healed by it although that would be ideal because then when it fails here in your finale we're expecting it to work so part of the problem is it doesn't work right like what is it what's wrong it didn't work but you said i know what i fucking said but it didn't work this has no power for me Mm because i didn't know that the silver was going to do anything before like (laughs) two seconds ago so when i get here and it doesn't work i'm like oh well that was just a waste of time right like so as you know as as the reader like if we can drop this silver earlier maybe in that conversation with jonesy that you've left out Mm -hmm. right like if you can see him shoot himself up with silver and get healed with something now we've introduced that like oh silver works in this way and then so then when her legs are broken and she like can't move and he pulls out a syringe we're like okay so she's gonna be fine because she's gonna be healed and then it doesn't work and now you actually get the emotional weight that you're going for here in that climactic moment yeah that makes sense that's really yeah that's good same with the gun here on page four so again dude (laughs) this made me so mad your use of the gun is really great so and what i love about it is that you slow down so and just to clarify for people listening because i know you know what i what i mean but well Mm -hmm. i assume you know what i mean but when i say slow down i mean you start adding words but it doesn't mean that you're adding words in a paragraph so you move to when he he opens a cabinet and they're being held hostage by two like big bads that have shown up to like they've stolen from them and they're like coming to get their stuff it's like the showdown with the, with this the boss level mm-hmm. and they're getting their asses kicked and so he's going to this cabinet to get this egg that they've stolen out of the cabinet um and so you have this moment where he opens the cabinet uh my fingers close around the faberge egg my eyes locking on a dull metal object beside it a gun and so all of a sudden here you're quote unquote slowing down and that you're going to spend time on this thing but it doesn't mean you're going to add paragraphs which i think this is like really masterfully done in that like you're making us spend time on the thing and slowing down but you're doing it in a way that feels rapid because sentences get really short and your paragraphs get like one sentence long right like a gun i glance at helena why does she have a gun she tilts her chin at me and shoots me a look loaded with meaning i know what she wants me to do use it use the gun what's taking so long right like so that like rap staccato beat i love how you're slowing down in the moment and i love how you're doing it with the staccato beat um because it keeps that tension moving and actually builds energy even though the piece has stopped moving and has paused on this moment right so or then here 
this was just fun um i've had enough of this reef says kill the bitch a flash of green light i whirl around bang 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 it happens so fast there's nothing reason simon can do to stop the bullets whizzing through the air and finding their mark great paragraph the gun clicks empty I can't stop my finger from pulling the trigger. Click, pull, click, pull, click, pull, click, pull. Right? Like the way you space those so forces us to like spin this moment where he's clicking this trigger, which is great because it's a good like slow down moment. And then, but it keeps it moving because you keep it short. Right? Like, so it's that great. There's this weird art in creating these moments of emotional tension where we quote unquote slow down and that we're going to force the reader to like sit in the emotional mess. But at the same time, you're utilizing a change in pacing to keep the reader super engaged, which is, which is awesome. Cause we don't want to, we do want to slow down, but we don't want to add paragraphs here because adding paragraphs also slows the pacing and that's painful. So all that being said, we have to see this gun before this moment. This is 100% Deus Ex Machina. A god yeah. has come out of the sky <laughs> to save the... Oh, there's a gun! Yes! So, like, you know, but it's um, it comes out of nowhere. And at this point, as a reader, I was like, all right, so this is an author who cheats. That's what I that's what I felt like. I was like, oh, okay. So there's no there's no tension is real. And the problem is like when you cheat like this, no tension is real tension. Right? Like mm -hmm. if and no scene can I trust the emotional flow of any scene because a god could fall out of the sky at any minute to save the day or a gun could appear in a cabinet any minute to save the day so we need to see this gun we need to see her do something with it we need her to mention that she has it we need her to and it won't change the surprise like the surprise of the gun being there can be in its location Right, like we don't need to see her put it in the cabinet. We don't need to see her put it next to the Fabergé egg. We just need to know that she has one, that there is a gun existing in the world. So that when he opens the cabinet, it's like, oh, that's right. She's got a gun, right? And it's there in the cabinet. Does that make that's sense? That's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And I've just thought of a place where I can add that into an earlier conversation. Perfect. Between them. That's awesome. And that's ideal. So that like, and again, like in your finale, we want all of these little like nuggets that you've set up along the way all of a sudden coming into a complete picture of like mm -hmm. oh he left all these breadcrumb trails for me and here's where it all comes together in the end um yeah since we're talking about a gun this just struck me i think this is just like an across the pond thing so cops show up at the end and the first thing um it says a harsh ripping sound cuts Hel Helena off, followed by a flash of violent light outside the window. Shit, what was that? I ask. Helena's eyes widened in panic. Go, she ordered. Uh, go, what do you? And then armed police, a voice shouts from outside. So this struck me as funny because in America, all the cops are armed. Like, that's not something they yell oh. because they're all like, they, of course, like, they can just yell police and it's like oh yeah some of them probably have like two or three guns and if it's a SWAT team they may have a tank so <laughs> like is that a UK thing yeah they yell this? yeah they're not all armed so only armed response units are armed <laughs> that's really funny okay that just struck me yeah don't change it it just struck me as funny I was like oh armed police it's like you know red apple um anyway <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah they're armed that's what they do. They pull guns on you. Uh, yeah, so anyway, that struck me as funny. Okay, so we talked about um, the gun. I got to check my list here. I'll just keep talking about the same things over and over again. We talked about the gun uh, and the needle. Um, let's talk about slowing down. So you, you did a really great job of slowing down in that mm -hmm. gun moment, mm -hmm. which again, you're like visualizing the scene as you write it you're like your natural bend towards cinematic movement is has really empowered you there right like because it's that like we're seeing it happen um there is a another but there's a place where i need you to slow down a couple of places where i need you to slow down um not be, and where I think your cinematic bend is actually hurting you 
because we need you to slow down, but we don't need anything to happen. We just need to sit in the emotional mess that you're in. So there we go. Middle of, I had one on page one. Where is it? Um, sorry, I got to look for it for a second. Oh, it's fine. Not there. Not there. Man. My notes are betraying me. Okay, I got another one in three. Um, okay, here we go. So where I want you to start slowing down is in moments of emotional pivots, small ones and big ones. So you've got two small ones. There's one at the top that I couldn't find, but there's, um, this is another one, right? Reeves laughs, and I'm just gonna read it how you originally wrote it. Reeves laughs, didn't know about the tracers, did you? You broke into my house, stole my egg, and I want it back. So those two phrases have different emotional tones, right? Didn't know about the tracers, did you? Right. Like that's him kind of teasing their like, you know, rookie status. Like you guys don't know as much as you think you did. Mm -hmm. You broke into my house. You stole my egg. I want it back. Those three quick sentences. There's a shift. Right. Like, can you feel the shift when I read yeah, the two? Definitely. Didn't want the tracers, did you? You broke into my house. Right. Like, so there's like a ha ha ha. All right. Suck it up to communicate that change in that pivot in tone give us a, some kind of dialogue tag movement body language something in between the break so that we can feel it right mm -hmm. like so that we can feel like oh there's a change mm -hmm. here so reeves laughs you didn't know about the tracers did you and then i just added the word amateurs because i'm just playing around but reeves laughs you didn't know about the tracers did you um he moved closer uh and with a sigh or like whatever you want his body language to be yeah now you <clears> broke <throat> into my house you stole my egg i want it back so like we can feel that like shift to seriousness. This is a small pivot. You have a bigger pivot on page five where she's crying. Um, here we go. So yeah, here we go. So in this paragraph, she starts um, getting hopeless because the silver doesn't work and she can't move. And uh, we have this place here where she's crying and then she pulls herself back together and it happens in three lines and especially in a finale this is like a big emotional moment um we're like in in the heat of something here so we need to just spend some time here we need to slow down and again slowing down doesn't mean adding paragraphs it just means adding some um additional space in the page to force the reader to sit with her while she's crying so originally you have um her lower lip quivers and then she breaks she shobs her shoulders shaking i want to i wrap my arms and mumble meaningless phrases into her uh mango scented hair eventually her tears stop she leans back what am i going to do so what i what and i said like your cinematic approach is hurting hurting you here you hit the visual moments right like you gave us all the visual moments but you didn't make us sit in the emotional mess so we got to sit there and you can use his dialogue to keep it moving but make us freeze so her emotional heart her and just backing up because you already have him talking right she slaps my hand away don't fucking pity me what that's not what i'm doing her lower lip quivers and she breaks. Have him say something. Yeah. She sobs, her shoulders sagging. Have him say something. I wrap my arms around her and um, and I would stop there. I wrap my arms around her. Have her respond to his arms, mm -hmm. right? Like, does she push away? Is she frigid? Because that actually tells us something about the visualization of the scene and how she's responding, right? Like, I mumble into her ear, into her mango scented hair let us hear mm -hmm. he mumbles right um and then here have we need a beat where she's going to try to recoup herself right she pushes me away and wipes the tears from her eyes and then have i say blank um she leans back what am i going to do so you can feel like if we slow it down this has more emotional weight and more power to it yeah um, definitely and it's that weird art art 
that we have to do as writers of like just if you want to think about it cinematically you're just going to keep the camera on her smile crying for a couple of minutes right like not for a couple of minutes even just for like 40 seconds in like mm-hmm. a real-time moment but by giving it like you know those 30 extra words that i dropped in there we can feel the pain of this and it it yeah. means something to us as a reader um and then when in the end when he leaves her it means even more yeah that's right. cool because it's almost like that moment in I know they do it in TV shows a lot where the music stops and you're just panned yeah, into I mean, that one person for a second. That's yeah. I've never thought about it like that, but that's the best. Mind. The best one I can think of is uh, off the top of my head is when Iron Man dies in Endgame. Have you mm. seen that one? I have. Yeah. Sorry, spoilers for anybody listening. To Iron Man. Dies <laughs> in uh, so at the, you know, there's this Iron Man has they've they Thanos is gone and there's a moment of celebration. And then everybody looks and Tony's like laying on the ground dying. And then we have this weird moment where everyone comes over to him one at a time, right? Like first it's his buddy, Rhodey. And then it's, and he just like, I think he just says Tony. He just says his name. And then we pan to Spider-Man who's got like three or four lines of like crying and like, oh my gosh. Then they pull Spider-Man back and then his wife comes over and then we all just sit in silence and i remember watching when i was in the theater watching it with my kids for the first time we were like sitting there and there's a moment where like all the music stops Mm -hmm. and you're just looking at him die at the end of like spider-man talking and you're just like sitting in this like silence of him dying and this little girl in the audience goes no like and they're like really loud (laughs) but that's totally what we want right like especially in a finale you're not going to get that kind of emotional connection in the short story because we've only spent 9,000 words yeah. and what, like what, 45 of them were with her, right? Like 4,500 of those words are with her. So it's not enough to build that kind of like, you know, 15 movie arc with Tony sure. Stark, but <laughs> that that little girl felt when he died. But at the same time, we want to be able to create the ability for that moment for people to be like, oh yeah, I'm connecting with her in this moment. And then if you remember, we end it, they slow down again when we go to the funeral mm-hmm. and you have a scene where they literally just push his little thing out into the water. And then they sit there and they pan the camera over everybody that's there. Part of that is, Oh, this is a cool shot where we get to see everybody together and we get this nice like summation, but we have to be able to create those moments literally as well. Liter- not literally as in like actually, but literally yeah. is like in literature where like, we can pull that moment with our with our people and it's not again it's not about adding paragraphs it's just about sitting in a moment for a minute and like getting these quick exchanges in that keep the tension up or keep the the weight up i but if you want it to feel weighty and you want it to feel heavy you might add a paragraph Right, like that, like visualization of the text on the page, knowing how the reader is going to encounter that, um, mm. especially since readers more and more are reading on their phone, and knowing that, like, if a reader is reading on their phone and you give them a paragraph, they're about to be faced with a block of text, right? Like it's a wall of text all of yeah. a sudden on their phone. So just knowing that that, like, that you have the ability, so we could think about it like, oh man writing is way harder with the visualization of it or you can think of it as a massive opportunity to be like oh i can strategically arrange these words on this page to make my reader feel what i want them to feel in this moment yeah so slowing down in the small flips i really want to find that first one it's something helena says and slowing down oh i know where it is slowing down in the fall in the small flips um Damn it, it's not there. Slowing down in the in the small flips, where it's just like a a a ah, here it is. Where it's just a change in the like th- phrasing of somebody saying, so we can feel that change. And then in the big places, really spending time to like break it out, um, mm. so that we're feeling what it is. It's this one right here. Um, she snaps out of it. What? Yeah, yeah, I know. We'll go back. This isn't it. Damn it. She snaps out of it, though. This was another note. Um, this is the only place where you tell me what she's doing and you don't show me with her body language. Um, mm. I don't, your body language is so great. <laughs> Lead into it, man. Show me. But that's not, the, that's not the moment I was looking for. I'll find it. 
no. Damn it. Okay. Let's talk about dialogue tags. Uh, anything else you want to talk about with like slowing down for emotional moments? No, no, that's really good. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. And I find as you're looking through the rest of this novella, um, because ideally you're going to have more of these mm -hmm. where you have mm -hmm. these like emotional pivots. Uh, I find that as I'm reading, if someone's voice changes in my mind, or if I want the reader to have a moment of like emotional impact, I know I have to slow down. And I'm, I first draft uh, pretty quick and I almost always miss them in my first draft. <laughs> this is an editing thing for me is like i always miss them so when i'm editing i know i have to watch for them um okay so you're doing this thing let's talk dialogue tags you're doing this thing uh which is great where you give us body language up front or a description up front and then they say something and then you move to the next person six times out of ten it works Four times out of 10, I'm like, wait, who said that last line? Especially if I'm listening to it, and I don't have the visualization of the paragraph to help me with it. So, you know, this is going to be an audio book at some point. Yeah. So let's just write for it now. Right. And we also know that our readers are coming to this with the mind of TV and movies. So let's just go ahead and help them not have to reimagine things. Right, so a hulking heavyset man stands outside a streetlight over a garden fence, smiling off of his bald scalp. You told me so much in a sentence. It's so great. <laughs> going somewhere, I narrow my eyes. Who are, right? So going somewhere, you can see as I read it out loud, is yeah. kind of hanging there. It could be with the next person. It could be with him. So just adding a dialogue tag here, he asks in a deep and menacing tone doesn't take anything away right like but lets us know that's who it is or here you do it again um my back strikes the kitchen wall and all the air goes out of me i crash the floor i blink swirling stars away stare up at the bald guy as he steps over the threshold in the kitchen you're a witch so are you right like i get i get that that visually attaches to the paragraph before but if mm -hmm. i'm listening to it you know you're gonna force me to take a moment and figure out who that is so just add a little i groan at the end yeah right like and if we use something besides like i said or i asked and we like enhance that tag a little bit it actually adds to the flavor of the moment right and we can mm -hmm. hear that he just slammed against the wall and that he's in pain right like so he's gonna groan it um which we weren't just catching with you're a witch right so again yeah. like using that dialogue tag to interpret how i'm supposed to hear in my imagination that phrase um you have a couple places here with dialogue tags where you're using them what are you doing i ask where i want you to get away from and i know i know the stephen king thing is like only use said or asked and yeah. never <laughs> use an ly word i get it um we all are like living in that shadow but here, like, this is a great place to give us something more descriptive. The ball guy stomps to the floor. Uh, sorry, the ball guy stomps the, stomps the front door and wrenches it open. What are you doing? I ask. How do you want me to hear that? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, is he pleading? Is he begging? Is he, like, angry? Is he, like, what's, how am I supposed to hear this phrasing? You get, just by replacing this one word, you can, dramatically change how this is how the reader's engaging with this um yeah and you can increase the cinematic moment of this reading right so throwing in a you know additional word or not an additional word but replacing your basic word with like something bigger um really helps does that make sense yeah absolutely yeah I think that was all I wanted to say about dialogue tags. Any thoughts on dialogue tags? Yeah, it is tough because the advice is always stick to said and ask. Mm -hmm. And there are, I know there are places where you should deviate from that. But I find it hard to pick out where that is. I find that there, when, when, a, when a sentence needs to be heard in an emotional way. So like here. 
what we were talking about. What are you doing? I ask, or I can find another one here as we talk. When it needs to be heard in an emotional way, um, and it, it's in a weird place where body language doesn't help, right? Where like mm. the words themselves need to communicate what's going on. Um, that's when we want to make it different. So it's not all the time. I feel like that advice, if I were to deconstruct that advice, where that came from, the whole like try never to use dialogue tags and try only to use said and ask. I feel like that's coming to a writer who's like using way too many, right? Like, you know, I want to go to the store. I said, we don't have to go to the store. We could go to the movies. She, she suggested, well, but I really want to go to the store. I pleaded um, anxiously as I r- wrung my hands together. She's stomping her foot. She said, blah, 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 blah. No, that's not what I want. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Like, so we get as writers, like we have these moments where we're way overusing mm-hmm. said and asked and, and we're throwing in these LY words. And they're like, I feel like though you're past that. I'm not, you're not overusing anything, right? Like, cause you're communicating so much with body language and so much with them standing alone. You're at the place now where it's like, okay, I'm going to bring these tools back because that's mm-hmm. all they are. They're just tools, right? Like said, asked, you know, or bigger things. They're not good or bad. They're just tools. It's like, is a hammer good or bad for building a house? Well, I, you know, it's just a hammer. So once you get to the place where you can understand that, like, I don't have to bang on everything with a hammer, you can pick it up when you need it and put it down yeah. when you don't. Right. So um, here's another one where like adding a dialogue tag at the end is going to change how I hear it. Right. So ice freezes in my gut, my chest, my limbs. What did you do? Is how you originally wrote it. Mm-hmm. And you heard how I read it, which is flat. What did you do? Right. So what did you do? I screamed. What did you do? I choked. What did you do? You know, I am, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm out of words, uh, <laughs> but adding words at the end of that, adding just two words at the end of that sentence interprets the emotional tone of that utterance for me. So that mm-hmm. as a reader, you're enhancing my experience by coming to it. And that's the difference between like, oh, I need to leave them all out, which is that like basic level of advice, which is like, you can imagine somebody trying to build a house and running around banging on everything with a hammer and leaving like big holes in the drywall everywhere, <laughs> right? Like, and you're like, stop using the hammer, right? So we're past that level of advice here. And now we're like, hey, you're trying to use a screwdriver here, but like, it's a nail. So like, just go get your hammer and like bang it in with a hammer. Um, the right tools for the right job. Uh, so, you know, adding them in, in these moments of emotional, where you need to interpret something for the reader emotionally, take that cinematic vision that you have and put it in there for the reader, um, to manipulate the reader's experience, uh, is, is a, is a positive way to use those, those dialogue tags. Um, okay. Let's talk about your lead character. Mm -hmm. Who is he? And I don't mean like, who is he backstory? I mean, like, how do you want me to read him? What do you want him to feel like to me? Yeah, I don't know if it comes across now. You've just said that in this scene, but he's supposed to be more snarky. Okay. Um, However, this is the first time he's encountered a situation like this. So I'm kind of toning that down. Is he a hero or an asshole? Or somewhere in between. Okay. Is he <laughs> self-sacrificing or self-serving? Uh, self-serving to begin with, self-sacrificing by the end. Okay. So there's <laughs> two moments here where I was like, oh, this asshole. So um, and it, the reason I ask is because if you wanted him to be self-serving at the end, it really works well. But if you... <laughs> If you want to be self-sacrificing at the end, we have to manipulate two. I don't know. It's tough. I'm, I'll just go yeah. into a little bit of backstory because it might. Okay. You might be able to advise on this, but essentially, his his mum is sick, and that's why he's stealing all this stuff to pay for 
this this witch bane that she's using to try and fend off the thing okay. that's making her ill. Um, so he is he's doing it for her, but at the same time he is like when he speaks to people, he comes across as an asshole. But it's yeah. a kind of like a protection. Uh, what am I trying to say? Like a self preservation mechanism. Gotcha. Kind of a character that's like always on the edge of um, cultural appropriateness. Yeah. As yeah. in like, you know, I'd steal that piece of bread if I was hungry because, yeah. you know, fuck them. But yeah, even though we're like stealing's bad, right? Like yeah. that kind of, okay. So he, they definitely come off that way, right? Like they're in a house alone playing cards, right? Like there's this, like, these are the anti-heroes, the like, you know, bad guys that stole stuff but we love them the lovable black yeah, guys exactly yeah exactly that. yeah my favorite movie that does that is snatch with uh oh i can't remember who's in it the only one i remember is brad pitt is in it and he does a cockney accent and it's uh <laughs> i've heard a terrible cockney accent but an amazing moment in a movie uh so um yeah so he comes off that way the problem is we and at the end where he's like questioning whether or not he should grab the egg and run you totally get that like i'm the anti-hero in that like i'm a i'm a good guy circumstances just made me do this right yeah, exactly. like circumstances yeah. made me be this way um so it's the uh i think of it as since we're talking movies i think of it a lot of times as like the goodwill hunting effect like i'm a genius who should like be like at the top of my class but i grew up in southie in boston and so every once in a while i pull my car over to the side to just beat the shit out of somebody <laughs> from like something they did to me in like elementary school right because this is the world that i live in um so you totally have that feel in the opening of the chapter there's a small place that's a problem at one point right here so Simon steps, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because these moments, big or small, communicate to me as the reader how I should feel about the character and who the character is. So Simon steps forward, arm raising, fingers glowing green. I stagger to my feet. No, don't do it. I'll do it. I'll give you the egg. Geek, no, Helena says again using a I changed it to bags mm -hmm. because using a dialogue tag to like show me how she feels that you may make that demands you may make that like something else yeah. if you really don't want to use a different dialogue tag there changing how she says it like don't you fucking do it geek reads differently than geek <laughs> no yeah. um yeah but that's going back and then he says shut up they'll kill you if i don't the shut up adds an emotional tone there that is different than who he's been in the rest of the piece. Who he's been in the rest of the piece is somebody who is scared and nervous and worried. Who he is next when we get to the gun is scared and nervous mm. and worried and out of his depth. Shut up is a, there's a lack of compassion in those yeah. two words. There's a taking control of the moment in those two words so when i read this sentence i was like oh that is standing out in a way that i'm not a, i'm i feels like i there's something about him that i've missed yeah as a reader so this is the small one where i was like who is this guy that he's going to tell her to shut up and i don't think you want it here i would just pull it you yeah. don't need it like they'll kill you if i don't is enough Right, like we don't need him to tell her to shut up. The other place <laughs> is when so a big guy surprises them at the back door. Um, there we go. A big guy surprises him at the back door, and he they're both scared because he's huge, and they figure out he slams them against the wall with a spell. They figure out really quick that he's he's uh, got witchcraft, and. So you are the oh, so are you the intruder points at Helena who propped herself up on her elbows, and you, Helen. This is another one of those places where, like, you may want to add something in here 
to let me know that that's still him saying it, but I, it wasn't as bad here because the context tells me who's speaking. So I'm okay mm-hmm. with it. Helen and I both heave ourselves to our feet. We share a look run. I say we dart out of the kitchen. I'm halfway down the hall with Helen in the back on my heels. He totally just left her in yeah. that room <laughs> with that huge guy. So if that's on purpose, <laughs> well done. But I read it. I was like, dude, and it reminded me of that joke of like, you know, a bear is chasing us. Ooh. And like, you know, <laughs> if I fast enough to outrun it, I don't need to be fast enough to outrun it. I just need to outrun you, right? Like, and like you almost want to be like, if you're going this way, you almost want to be like throw a chair in front of her so that like she, she gets stripped up. Like, if you're going to do that, go all the way. But I don't think because of the how you've written the character in this scene, very compassionate for her. And that's not what he's doing. So you got to add something here so that he's not leaving the room first. As it's like, as it was like, ah, like, get out of here. So we want to do like, <laughs> we share a look, have him say run, Ugh. and then have him do something. Right, like, and it can even be comical because he is like comically helpless in this. So, like, have him just like pick something up off the floor and throw it at the guy. Like, you know, anything that's just like something. Yeah, you've got a deck of cards in the room already. Have him grab the deck of cards and like throw him at the guy, (laughs) and then yell "run," and they can both run right and get her out in front, not behind him, because. And it's not a sex thing. It's not about like a guy, you know, taking care of the girl. It's about who is your character, right? Like, even if this were another dude in the room, is your character the guy that runs out of the room first, leaving the other person to potentially get mangled by this giant? Or is your character the guy that like tries helplessly to distract this person while you get away and then is going to take care of himself? Your character is clearly the second one. Yeah. Which is a better and easier hero to follow. The first one is a, it's that's a tough hero to live with for the whole, yeah, for a whole story. Um, oh, that's funny. Yeah, you can do it I, again since we're talking movies. Disney Plus is Loki, did it in an amazing. Seen it yet. Oh, Please okay. I won't spoil it. it. I won't spoil <laughs> it. But they take it. They take an antihero, and they make you love him at the end. Um, and he's the guy that runs out of the room first, and by the end he's not right and so we're at the end of the piece even if he is the guy that runs out of the room first the beginning of the piece here we need him not to be that guy so yeah just don't don't have him leave first have him do something else um okay let me check my notes we talked we've talked about the run we've talked about um oh there's one place where you're losing a character voice in three so you've got reeves who is this like menacing guy um that they stole from before this moment reeves is very much like in control and very um doesn't say much right like so silence does for delore uh no here we go we can start getting Reeves' voice here. Uh, mm-hmm. Reeves strides into the room, uh, strides into the sitting room, face set in a stone mask. Nice work, Simon. Uh, she asks him if he's a witch. I am. He casts an eye over the sitting room, taking the wallpaper, the cheap Ikea so- sofa, the chipped uh, charity shop coffee table in the corner, his nose wrinkles. What a shithole. Reeves glances from Helena to me and asks, where's the egg? So three first, my introduction to this character, right? Mm -hmm. If we're just taking his words, I am, what a shithole, where's the egg, right? Like on point, tight business. He's there for business. Yeah. Um, We get down here a little bit more and this continues all the way through, right? Like here he cracks his back he doesn't even say anything reeves appears before me in a flash of moment his hand whipping out crack the backhanded slap catches me across the cheek with a sharp sting and whatever spell he used on me snaps um so like here we don't even he's not even talking right like he's this like business badass who's here for his egg and he doesn't really give a care about these two and then you put a whole paragraph (laughs) in his mouth 
and it's like okay we've like got like the villain monologuing right <laughs> reeves crouches down in front of me witchcraft lose traces unique to the witch who mm. uses it right like no no world really <laughs> unless you, unless you're experienced enough to hide them i'm highly sensitive to the magic residue mm. once i sniffed out your power i cast the locator spell and tracked you here he's he doesn't care about these two people. He's not going to explain to them magic in this moment. Yeah. We can still get all of this across by keeping his character voice, right? Like, so um, how'd you find us, right? Your unique trace. My, my, my unique trace. What do you mean? What, how'd you, what do you mean? And he could be, he could be like, magic leaves a trace dumbass yeah. and that's that's all i need right like do you have a magic detector no i used a locator spell moron <laughs> right like and that's all like that's it that's all i need right like so keeping him in those like tight business like i don't give a shit about you but like you know i and even if you can phrase it in this like i'm astounded by your stupidity yeah you stay in his voice and you can still get that world building in that you need in your novella. Um, but yeah, so just making sure that we, and I find I do this, I do this too with villains in that like a lot of times I need a villain to like, especially in my mystery series, I'll need a villain to like explain their motivations. And in my first draft, I'll totally have the like villain monologuing. Oh, I got you and I did it for this reason and you'll never catch me. Don't you feel bad? And I'm like, oh, come on. This isn't what's going to happen here. So once I find one of those paragraphs, I I realize like, oh, I got to break this out. Like this has yeah. to happen in, in multiple exchanges because you got to get the world building out. Like, you know, in my mysteries, I have to have the villain reveal why he did it because he's the only one that knows why he did it. Mm -hmm. And we can assume. But in those instances, I'm going to have my detective like pull it out of it right like maybe the detective is going to suggest something wrong like you were just so desperate to get this thing and then the villain would be like i wasn't desperate i was angry it's like okay here we are like so but like just by giving interaction here we can pull this paragraph out and keep it into the style that you've got going which is this yeah. like rapid exchange in a big cast scene by the way, great job in a big cast scene, not losing any of the characters. I know where everybody is all the time. Thank uh, you. Rapid exchange in a big cast scene. Uh, and at the same time, um, keeping his character voice, but still getting this information across that you need to get across for like how he found them in this house where they're just like sitting there playing cards. Um, yeah. Any, any thoughts about that or any questions about that? No, I... I just can't believe I didn't spot it before. You know, sometimes when you've been over something, not that I've been over this that much, but you just go blind to it. Yeah. I think you just think, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why beta readers are great, especially beta yeah. readers who have a tight ear because they can be like, okay, this doesn't. Look, what are you doing here? Um, yeah. yeah. So, and it's, it, I, I recommend, I know I do this. I've actually never recommended this to anybody before, but I'll just say it out loud because this is something I do. Edit your finale twice to three times more than you edit everything else. Mm -hmm. the, you know, back when I, when I was a preacher, we always used the joke, you can speak for an hour, but people are only going to remember the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes. Yep. And <laughs> the same thing is true in a story we get hooked by the beginning and we remember the ending so and a thousand disasters in the messy middle will be forgiven <laughs> by a tight ending right if you can bring the gun in and you can bring in the silver and yeah. you've got your nail in reeves's voice and the action's fantastic and your hero is your hero in the end all sins of the previous five chapters are forgiven because your reader is like, oh, when Helena cried, it was the best, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, oh, the last thing I want to talk about that you're doing mm -hmm. really great, and I wanted to point it out for anybody that listens to this because it's a fantastic device. So at the end, you bring a voice from the outside, which we've talked about a little bit, which is this cop. And what it does, which is fantastic, is it forces timing into the ending. It forces a like 
hourglass ticking down into the end of the conversation. So uh, they're talking about um, she's crying. She kind of pulls herself out of it. Um, she tells him to take the egg. And then all of a sudden we hear these cops outside. And the cops are yelling all the way back up here. Armed police a voice shouts, this is the magic, this is the magical investigations department. Come out with your hands up. By introducing this voice from the outside, you create a like you force decisions, right? Like you've got this is almost a new scene within a scene mm -hmm. where now you're forcing them <laughs> to make decisions again it's it's a new inciting incident cops are here and what's great is that they start talking about the decision they're going to make and then you throw in the cop's voice every once in a while which is a fantastic technique to keep that clock running right come out now the officer says they can bag a little bit more with each other he twists back he starts to make a decision. He thinks about it, running running out of the room. Um, so we're seeing like, did I miss one? I thought there was another one in here. So we're seeing like him make the choice based on the inciting incident. And then you really build the tension here at the end. She tells him to wipe down the gun. And he's like, what? Fingerprints. I scoop the gun off the floor. I wipe it down with my t-shirt. Careful not to touch it with my bare skin. You have five seconds. The officers, the counting is such a great way to build, <laughs> artificially build tension. Go now, she says. Five, Helena. Geek, just go. Four, shit, I say. Three, right? Like that, like counting down from the voice from the outside just like creates this race to the end. That's really great. Um, I did want it once more yeah. because we go a little bit here without the ticking clock reminding us that it's speaking. So I just wanted one more in there. Um, okay, cool. just to remind us like oh yeah the cops are outside uh but that it's a fantastic device you use here at the end to like because we've come to this moment where she's like crying right like if we're thinking about it on our emotional flow chart we were here we went high real fast when the giant comes in we stay high in intensity as the um as reeves is like kicking their ass and then we like climax when he finds the gun and shoots them and then we dip down in intensity when she's crying because she realizes she's not going to get back up her legs aren't going to work again right and so you could have ended here on this low point but yeah. that's a that's a sad and crappy ending where he's like <laughs> taking the egg out he's like i guess i'm gonna go do the meeting now you stay here <laughs> paralyzed for life right so bringing the cops in shoots that emotional energy back up so we can race to the end it creates a great device for him to grab the egg and run because now there's a reason for him to run right like so it's a it's really the voice from the outside is a really nice tool to use to like create that like um i gotta go the thing is you only get to use it once mm -hmm. so if you use it in the next book again because you're using it in the novella he has to comment on it not this shit again and it's not going to have the same emotional <laughs> impact it's a trick we can pull out of our bag right like you know you're a magician you only get to pull the rabbit out of your hat once. Yeah. If you pull the rabbit out of your hat twice, the audience the second time is like, yeah, yeah, we know you got a rabbit in the hat, right? <laughs> like, and so, and if you pull the rabbit out of the hat, hat twice, you have to comment on the fact that you're doing it twice, <laughs> right? Like, so this is one of those moments in a, in a series where you only get to do it one time. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's great here. I wouldn't change it at all. I think it's perfect. Uh, but I just wanted to note it as like a really great tool that you get to use. Same with the gun. You only get to pull a gun out of a cabinet, a magical gun out of a cabinet once yeah. without the second time without him going like, shit, guns just appear whenever I need them, right? Like without <laughs> commenting on it because the reader is going to be like, oh, it's the gun in the cabinet trick again. Look at this happening. Um, yeah, unless you're writing YA because Harry Potter gets away with it at the end of every, every book. Oh, yeah. Harry Potter like, you know. <laughs> all of a sudden something happens where he could like Voldemort like appears at the end and you're like oh there he is again uh so evidently in YA you can totally get away with it but yeah. you have too much cussing for this to be YA so oh, yeah yeah <laughs> you're not gonna get away with YA this <laughs> so uh unless that's a UK thing all of the teenagers read cussing in their stuff but Harry Potter's UA, uh, UK too so it doesn't work um anyway <laughs>
<laughs> so yeah you got to um you only get to use that tool once but you use it really well here so it wouldn't take it away but just cool. know that in book three if you like have the cops outside again <laughs> he's gonna have to talk about them he's gonna have to be like this shit again like you, know. <laughs> you can almost have a comedic moment where he's, he like starts calling out numbers for them i read that in one book where there's like oh that's good five <laughs> and then he yells back four ah uh, yeah <laughs> so like that kind of but you're you're when you're doing that kind of stuff you're acknowledging to the reader like yes i know i've used this device before yeah. we all know that i've used this before just stay with me it's fun right like so yeah just letting the reader know that anyway um that was all i had anything else you want to talk about no i'm all good oh dude all right thanks for letting me walk through this with you it was great no that's cool yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording. We can chat a little bit more.